Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Foster Inclusion Podcast, and thank you so much for joining me. I'm your host, Saida Gomez Fleury. In this episode, I discuss financial inclusion in Ethiopia and Eritrea with Cal Casa of Bitcoin Burr and Bitcoin Nakfa. I first became aware of Cal in an article called Check Your Financial Privilege by Alex Gladstein for Bitcoin Magazine. Cal is in the media business and a daily user of Bitcoin using the Lightning Network. After studying at Chapman University, he returned to his native Ethiopia, where he began his career in business advisory for privatization clients making investments into the country. Today, Cal manages various Bitcoin-centric initiatives between San Jose, Austin, and Addis Ababa. Bitcoin Burr and Bitcoin Nakfa have actually received millions of Satoshis in donations from NFL player Russell Okung, who happens to share the same birthday as my daughter, day, not year, and Ray Youssef, CEO of Paxful. Join us for this entertaining look into financial inclusion and how the Lightning Network facilitates small cross-border transactions. It is so nice to, um, I guess, meet you again virtually. Well, pleasure is 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 all mine. Thank you for you know uh, taking interest in in the story and then you know taking time to to do this call. So, yeah, I read about you uh, the first time in the Alex Gladstein article. Check your financial privilege, and then I started to follow you on Twitter, and then I joined your Telegram groups. Bitcoin Burr. How do I pronounce it again? Bitcoin Burr. So you're, you're saying it right. Bitcoin Burr and Bitcoin Nakfa. So before we get to your projects, though, I want you to share a little bit about you to our listeners. So what's your name? Where were you born? And where do you live? Sure. So my name is Cal. Uh, I go on, on Twitter and, and things like this by Cal Casa. And I live in Addis Ababa. Uh, it's the capital of Ethiopia. And currently I'm in uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, okay, so you, you still live in Addis, but you're in Austin. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit everywhere right now. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think, uh, so right now work is here and all my things are there. So uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> going back and forth. You're juggling. So, um, like from a cultural perspective, what are some of the similarities or differences between life in Addis and life in Austin? Uh, well, the the biggest difference is, uh, of course, you know, the wealth and the development and all of the tools that I have here in, in, in the United States. Um, for example, if I wanted to buy a you know, small device for, for work or, you know, some computer equipment or any kind of um, a software subscription for either my, my work or my personal life. Um, in the States, it's quite easy to do, right? Yeah. Dollars, debit card, credit card, like you're good. If I was in Ethiopia, I, you know, because I'm a diaspora, I would get a, a certain privileges but for the most part, most people don't have those linkages. They don't have those tools. Um, so they don't have dollars. And if it's, if it's like a physical item, right? Like I bought a little, uh, you know, I, iPad, right? It's an Apple product. Yeah. And so he, it, it was like quite cheap, right? I mean, a few hundred bucks, six or 700 bucks, got a brand new one, right? If I was in Ethiopia, that same product would be um, probably the equivalent of a thousand or a thousand two hundred dollars, right? So, oh wow, yeah, there's a two x markup. So it's it's so sorry. What was the cost of your iPad in the U S. In the U S. So the iPad was uh, seven hundred, and then uh, like some additional pieces and and, and things like that. But um, yeah, so uh, you know. For those reasons, um, working here is a lot easier, 
And, um, you know, but, you know, also to just bring it back to maybe some things that do matter, which are, you know, kind of the, the your, your personal life, right? Uh, how you yeah. feel uh, in the morning, right? And, and kind of those uh, social link- linkages, right? Um, that maybe don't have anything to do with business. Um, for, for me, I think those linkages are strongest in uh, Ethiopia. Um, just yeah. because I've been living there for the past eight years now. And it's just, it's become home. Um, it's where I, you know, I've built my little community. And uh, so, so yeah, uh, Ethiopia will always be home. But, you know, when, when work calls, I might have to come to, to the United States some. Yeah, I I totally relate. When I was, um, so I did a trek in Ethiopia, two weeks. Um, I tracked the Simeon Mountains with a group. And um, it was such, I like, it was such a feeling that I've never felt before. For example, people on the street would call me Habisha. Am I pronouncing it right? And um, so long as I didn't speak or reveal sort of any of my cultural background, I felt like I blended right in and I really did feel at home. It was like, it was such a a beautiful, beautiful experience. And when I returned back, I thought, wow, we're really cold in Western countries. Like the sense of community is not at all the same. So I hear totally what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and, you know, those, those are the things I miss. And even, um, even within the, uh, you know, because I, I, I see that you have a very kind of cosmopolitan background and um, yeah. you've lived in. What, what are the exact countries that you've lived in and kind of cultures that, that you've been exposed to? So I was born and raised in Canada, in Toronto. Um, my parents, my family is from Trinidad and Tobago. I lived in Trinidad for two years as a baby, so I don't have strong memories. Uh, And then in my third year of university, I lived in France. I lived, studied, and worked part-time in France. I returned to Canada, and then I moved to Switzerland in 2008. So I've lived in a few different cultures, and I've traveled to, like, I don't know, maybe 30 or so different countries, uh, different languages. And I've been lucky enough to have traveled where I've spent, like, two weeks or more in different regions uh, for professional reasons and also for, like in a capacity that allowed me to not be like a 100% tourist, but allowed me to sort of like interact with people and be exposed to local culture. No, I mean, I think that, so you, you've been to, you know, probably 30 to, you know, different countries and, and interacted with probably dozens of, of those cultures. You know, for, for me, it's, um, you know, sometimes because I did grow up in California, uh, I went to, you know, public schools and, and, you know, all throughout my, my youth, you know, I went to, uh, Chapman University. I studied political science. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it looking back. You're smart. <laughs> I'm, I'm not really, I, I just kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I, I passed, <laughs> but I really enjoyed my classes and I took really interesting, uh, so I, w- I was a political science major, and I, but you know the way I ended up taking my classes, um, you know, a lot of uh, you know religion and theology, and yeah, as well as business classes, entrepreneurship, and then chat yeah. big film school. So I, I would sneak into their like late late night pro- like you know uh, projects and like programs, and they had all of these you know amazing kind of lectures. So. You know, I, I kind of just you know built my 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 um, I guess career if if we want to talk. So yeah, I'm. Uh, well, what questions might you have for me? I'm sorry, I'm kind of like talking about myself. Uh, no worries, no worries, no worries. We're just uh, like I guess getting warmed up. But just really quickly, um, I want to touch a little bit more on Ethiopia before moving on to uh, your projects because I think that it would be of service to listeners uh, to get more insight into Ethiopia, its culture. You mentioned uh, studying religion, its religion, and the impact it's had in my personal opinion, on the world. Can you give us sort of a snapshot of Ethiopian history and culture and some of the sites that tourists can see? Sure, sure. So, you know, it's, it's great that you've had that experience to come out to Ethiopia and do the trek. Um, Ethiopia has a, a very long 
kind of religious history and, and a long kind of biblical history, um, three, five thousand years, um, uh, you, you can see Ethiopia really take shape as, as a state um, and, and uh, as a culture. And we can, you know, really draw our lineage to, I think it's called Dem and, and, and some of those early kind of civilizations. Um, and Ethiopia, uh, you know, like I said, it's, 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 uh, you know, world, you, uh, I think UNESCO, um, a UN program has all of these world heritage sites and programs. I want to say at least seven, if not nine are in Ethiopia. Yeah. Yep. There's, there's a lot to, to see the Lalabellas and, and, you know, the different uh, castles and the churches made out of, you know, rock and, and all of this. So, yeah. And, and then if you, you know, I mean, so it, I, I always, you know, joke with my friends, if I could have any job in the world, it would be the Minister of Tourism. Yeah. It would be the most amazing job. You, I mean, off fire, you have these like salt flats, um, the Donegal yeah. and, and uh, some of the hottest uh, kind of, you know, little forms and salt comes from there. So it's, uh, yeah. And then, yeah, uh, when you go down south, it becomes more lush and, uh, and, you know, we share a border with Kenya. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of resource. There's a lot going on. Uh, it's, yeah. it's beautiful. It's young, but it's, we're still broke. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 That's that, yeah, totally. That's the challenge here. You know? That's the challenge. And actually, um, I think, is it uh, burr means salt, right? Uh, so burr actually means uh, silver. Uh, silver, okay. That's what it directly translates to, but burr has become kind of our, our uh, I guess you'd say colloquial um, yeah. uh, money, right? So that's, that's how we refer to money, or at least money in paper form. Um, and then one grade above burr, this, the silver coin, would be uh, the work. Work is gold. So okay. Um, and it was at you know during the forties, fifties, sixties, um, a lot of these currencies were actually uh, backed uh, by silver and gold. So that that's yeah. how the term originates, right? Um, that it'll it's only in like recent history that you know either you know most of the uh, standard of kind of gold kept kept in in, in, in the different forts and then treasuries around the world have, have kind of disappeared or they're they're not there altogether you know and for Ethiopia does that coincide with Bretton Woods in 19 I think 71 or is that a separate incident uh, so 71 when you had Nixon take us uh, off the gold standard it affected everyone um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, looking back into um, some of the other histories, uh, and World War II is, is, is a big uh, equation in this, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of gold is shifting, um, to, to say the least, right? There's an entire history as to the, the, the Jewish experience um, and, um, and the gold that was uh, stolen from them, right? Um, yeah. Like they were, right? I heard these these horrible stories of, and I think a lot of that gold was being processed in Switzerland. Um, so there's interesting history there too. Um, yeah, but uh, um, but yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, the Ethiopian bur, um, I think is has come to mean many things now, um, not just the the silver coin, but also the, the paper currency. The paper currency. Which is worth less and less, you know? Which is worth, yes, exactly. And because um, I think there's a connection in my mind, and you'll obviously correct me, between like um, small to mid-sized businesses, tourism, and the valuation of the currency. Um, and the reason I said this is that, so in my experience, we had local guides, we were told to pay them in US dollars and not in local currencies. And from my understanding, um, a lot of Ethiopians run small to mid-sized businesses. Is this kind of what it looks like or is there something more? No, absolutely. You, you, you got it. I mean, most of, 
Um, well, if you look at Ethiopia as a whole, about 70% is still rural. So um, yeah. you know, out in the countryside, it's most likely you know, farming or something to do with agriculture. Um, and then you have the cities, which aren't really, um, there are many now, but they don't have a, a large population. It's really Addis Ababa where the commerce and the population um, is. So, and in Addis Ababa, yeah, I mean, most of the people tend to be, um, you know, traders and, and merchants um, and, and, you know, uh, at least judging from the Addis Ababa Chamber of Commerce and some of those members of that association, um, a, a large majority of them are uh, traders. They're, they, you know, they're agents, um, often brokers or, or logistics or something like that. That, that, that tends to be a lot of the, the economy. Yeah. So um, I've read about remittances in many different countries. What does that look like in Ethiopia? Like, is that a significant contributor to GDP as well? Uh, so, yes, I think you had in your um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, you, you sent me some material that looked at remittance um, across different uh, data sets. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the, the World Banks or, or some of those international organizations saying a remittance is, you know, half a billion to one billion a year. And then Ethiopia and the National Ethiopian Bank and some of the statistical analysis on the Ethiopian side say, you know, three to five billion, right? Um, and so I, I look at that and I say, I'm, I'm most likely going to side towards the Ethiopians. Um, okay. If, you know, if the Ethiopians, and, and so then the natural question goes, does that five uh, a billion, right, in remittance, um, where is it coming from? And, you know, how, uh, does it add value to, to Ethiopia? And usually it's coming through like a world remit and things like that. But also, are there illicit markets or like black markets involved yeah informal channels was the term used <laughs> uh, and my uh, humble answer would be probably and probably a vast majority and also i i, I want to note here you know um i don't i i don't regard the the son in america sending his parents like you know two hundred dollars for the a holiday. I don't consider that a crime or illicit or shady or anything. Yeah, yeah. He chooses to do that, um, and they they want to get a better black market price for it. Um, then, you know, that's that's. I, I feel like I, I could look the other way. What I often see happening is the the banking, um, let's say, executives <laughs> in Ethiopia. Are, are involved um, in this at a much larger pace, right? And it's almost l legitimized, right? Um, and, and so I've, I've seen this with my, with my eyes, you know? So, yeah. Uh, and I see that it was almost systematic, right? On a monthly basis, boom, 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 boom. Um, they're stealing from them themselves, right? Because those are dollars that could have gone into government coffers and, and used for good things, right? Um, importing medical goods and X, Y, and Z. Instead, they're importing other things, right? Um, and just the most profitable thing, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. And so, uh, so and it, because I want to be very cautious as to like, if I, if I say that there's a wrong, I don't want to like, I don't want to throw everybody in one bucket, you know? Of course, of course. Yeah, so that, uh, but yeah, uh, so the remittance is, is an interesting uh, discussion in itself that's that's uh, an entire chapter most definitely and of course like from my perspective i think of that because i think that it's a very strong use case for bitcoin um i've spoken to people from various regions who have all said that uh, the re the remittance market is is very important with respect to bitcoin but i'd like to know how you actually became involved in bitcoin one and then two after that what inspired you to create bitcoin burr and bitcoin nakfa uh sure so um the first question was you know 
what ins- what 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 got me in it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so first time I heard about Bitcoin was 2013. My college roommate was mining it, and I thought it was like you know, internet money, and it was kind of cool. But also, I remember he paid more in um, like uh, energy uh, at the end of the month because we all split the bill and all of that and because. Yeah. It- PC was taking up a lot of energy to, to, you know, to mine it. And I just thought it was a cool thing. Um, I just, I thought it was an alternative investment. Like that's, you know, yeah. magic internet money. Um, really cool. Like, let me focus on some real money though. You know what I mean? yeah. <laughs> so that, that was my attitude to it. Um, and then years went by, right? And so I ended up in Ethiopia. I started working for Grant Thornton, uh, global advisory firm they they do a lot of, kind of transaction advisory tax audit um and you know i, I was doing a lot of their kind of business development and proposal uh, writing and things like that and so again i i i was working kind of that fiat world you know yeah where it's very interesting right there's a lot of money moving around yeah it's fast <laughs> yeah fast and and you know you know exactly how how you know, how those worlds operate. And I think we, we kind of share a similar, um, uh, maybe experience throughout, you know, but, um, so again, you know, Bitcoin wasn't on my radar and then early 2020. So, uh, you know, last year I started hearing about it in Ethiopia. Um, some graphic oh, designers oh. that I work with were using it. Um, they were saying, Hey, look, it's much easier. Can you you know, oh, you're American, aren't you? Like, go figure it out. Like, try to, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, stuck being the middle man, you know what I mean? Um, and so, but again, it was something I, somebody else liked, right? I didn't look into it. And then um, I actually had to leave Ethiopia on, like, short notice. So there was a, there was an assassination um, in Ethiopia. Oh, dear. Yeah, and it turned into this, this mess, right? And then... Um, the uh, the internet was down for three weeks, and uh, yeah, three weeks. Yeah, <laughs> there was SMS and then there was phone call. So, it so um, on the uh, fifth day, I left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I'm out. Sorry. <laughs> and I had a um, had a backpack. And I had uh, a boombox because my brother, I have two brothers and, and the one in Ethiopia, um, he, he runs a small business. He, he owns a bar. And, yeah. Well, now he has a bar and restaurant. So he, um, he says, oh, take my, my old stair. It's like this big Bose boombox thing. He's like, take it. I'm like, why? And he's like, oh, uh, you need to fix it and then bring it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> fix it and because the parts are expensive it's like you know three times the price. yeah you know what i mean yep so i'm like okay no worries so i had my backpack i had my laptop i had his stereo boom box i had no you're p- such a good brother <laughs> i'm still wearing random clothes that i find and like so i leave all my things i'm like I'll, 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 i'm just gonna get some internet and i'll be right back you know and uh and yeah it's been almost a year now <laughs> yeah i haven't <laughs> i still have you know my brother's boom box i'm you know i'll go back any day now but but yeah do you take like pictures and send them to him of his boom box <laughs> he's forgotten about it he's, he's he'll probably be surprised if i bring it back <laughs> so that was your sort of like parlay into uh into bitcoin and it's funny that um that it's like your associates in Ethiopia that brought you to it. You'd have been exposed to it. And again, it's this practical, pragmatic case that like brings you back into it. So then from there, what led to the creation of Bitcoin Burr and Bitcoin uh, Nakfa? Well, I mean, even b- before I get to the creation, I mean, uh, you know, on that point, um, you know, y- so you have to imagine you're so I, I, I left Addis Ababa in a rush, right? And so I'm grabbing my things. I'm, you know, where's my, you know, hard drive? You know, the things that matter, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, where's my money, right? So yeah. 
I remember going and waiting at uh, the bank was, I normally bank with uh, Bank of Abyssinia, but for some reason they were, they were like network was doing weird things, like they were closed pretty much. And, um, and so I just remember, and so because dollars are illegal in Ethiopia, right? I can't really yeah. have dollars on me, you know? So I have to like request a bank to give me just a few hundred dollars to travel. Wow. Right? And usually they set those limits or those, those maximums at around $300, right? They might scoot you up like $500. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, exactly. So you're, and this is your own money. Like you have it and you just can't take it out. So hold on, I'm, just a little pause. How do you buy like a plane ticket and stuff? Do you have credit cards or? So me, fortunately, I have, you know, family and friends and I'm an American diaspora, so I can have those cards available. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot easier for me. Um, yeah. and, and that's also why, you know, I don't keep a lot of money in Ethiopia. Why would I, right? Exactly. If I have the privilege to keep it in America where it's not going to devalue, where I can move it as, as, as freely as semi freely as I want. Right. Um, I'm going to do something. So yeah, these are things. And I think, you know, on your note of financial, um, or I guess it's, uh, um, kind of in- inclusion, right? Yeah. I, I would say the best way to get to that inclusion is to have freedom of, of money and having that financial freedom to own dollars if you want to, Bitcoin if you want to, what happened. Yeah. And it, it was at that time where it became really real for me, you know, because it's not yeah. like I can take gold across the border, right? Um, like the airport just wouldn't allow that, you know? Um, so shove it in the boom box, like <laughs> take all the parts out and just shove it in <laughs> boom box. Uh, you know, bringing it back into Ethiopia, they're going to tax me. And so, you know, uh, and, uh, so this, this, there's a mega bull called, um, Michael Saylor. I'm sure you, 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 oh yes, of course. Yeah. So he's, he's, uh, I think put everyone's wealth in that fund, which is great. Um, he's taught a lot of people about Bitcoin, but he's, 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 t- he, he talks about a story where, um, he, uh, was trying to move a few million out of, uh, I think it was like Argentina or Brazil or a country in, in South America. And, um, and he's calling his advisor. He's like, can you like put it on a mule and get it out of there? Like, <laughs> yeah. no, like get it in gold and like smuggle it out. No. Uh, he's like, we can't wire it. No. And then he's like, can we buy yachts and s- yeah. yacht, like expensive yachts, right? And sail the yachts to like the, you know, some, some uh, yard uh, abroad. And, and that didn't work either. So um, <laughs> he, you know, it, of course he has millions and millions that he's trying to move around. And I have, you know, a, a very humble... <laughs> But it's that very same thing that like got me into Bitcoin. I'm just like, you know what? I can't, I need to have access to my money and custody over it at any time. And that's why the Bitcoin thesis makes sense. You know, if you're yeah. super rich, then you want to store a value. You, you know, you have enough property and, you know, your, your capital is, is just appreciating, right? So you need to put it somewhere. Um, yeah. And, and so Bitcoin is great. Like that's, that's why all of these Michael sailors have gone into it. Um, I feel like for me, it's, I have to pay a graphic designer. I owe him 50 bucks. Western union's going to charge me you yeah. know, bucks to move that 50. Right. So it's like, doesn't, it's not gonna, for me, it, it, it doesn't make sense to even have small contracts anymore. You know, if yeah, I can totally pay payments. So Bitcoin for me is a complete like utility. I, I also even use it as a unit of account, which like people don't do because it's so volatile. Um, people talk about dollar, but like, no, I usually quote things in, in Satoshi. Um, nice. You know, and in Bitcoin. And so yeah, I've, uh, I've pegged my life to, to, or at least my, my work life to, um, to, to Bitcoin, it's, it's easier. That's amazing. 
That is amazing. I'm not, um, for me, it's still a store of value. Like I stack as frequently as I can. Again, I'm humble as well. And um, I've made a few payments in Bitcoin. I donated to Bitcoin.org. Although with this recent, um, whatchamacallit, judgment involving fake Toshi, I'm not sure that I will make any further uh, donations. Did you hear about that? Nope. What's going on? No. Um, I forget the name of the the current host of Bitcoin.org, I think. Um, I have to check the names. But was taken to court by Craig Wright, the gentleman claiming to be the real Satoshi. And apparently because... Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of... What happened? I'm sorry. Well, apparently, I should probably check uh, uh, read again before I say too much. But apparently, because I think his name is Cobra, his his Twitter handle is Cobra, because he didn't want to reveal his uh, real identity or something, the case was uh, basically uh, cited in favor of Craig Wright in the UK court. So I think Bitcoin.org may no longer be allowed to host the white paper, if I have the details uh, right, in the UK. Fair, fair, but you know, the thing, I think I host the white paper, like on some- Yeah, I know, it's the internet, like. <laughs> try to ban it, good luck, like, you know, it's it's gonna be- Yeah, about. but Bitcoin.org is like a very symbolic website, so. But I made a donation there, and I donated to uh, Signal, I think, in Bitcoin, and uh, I invested in like uh, the solar panel project in Bitcoin. Like I have millions, like I donated Satoshis. <laughs> but for the most part, I hodl. I'm just like with my family, I've persuaded my husband that it's a great store of value, that it's worth it to just buy some and just let it sit there and wait, wait for 10 years low time preference yeah yeah no i completely agree and you know and also it's it's you know it'd be you know you and i i think we have uh, you know the ability to have little you know uh, credit cards and debit cards and things yeah like that. um and our paypal and venmo works all the same and so you know i think for us you're right um a store of value makes makes the most sense you know but i know a lot of people where yeah the best way to send money to someone it is definitely and uh bitcoin beach in el salvador and the fact that it's legal tender there now to me is just remarkable like i'm still stuck in the phase where i'm just amazed that this thing that is totally decentralized it has no leader whatsoever is influencing so many people across so many cultures for me that is one of the most amazing accomplishments ever <clears throat> if you think of countries that have adopted the US dollar, if you think of other things that have been sort of forced upon people because they had no bargaining power, because <clears throat> they needed these things in order to trade, and you consider this like this this piece of software that who knows who created it, you know? Over the span of what, like 11 11, 12 years now, it has just expanded incredibly. Like, I find it to be one of the most fascinating things ever. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I think you have probably different uh, milestones or cornerstones in, in history. Um, you know, we, we had the printing press or, you know, yeah. uh, cars or planes and, and uh, or space travel, right? And so that one's pretty cool. And um, and so all of these things, I think, grow us differently as as a species, right? Um, or you would hope all of us at the same time, right? Yeah. Well. <laughs> and so uh, and I think yeah. So Bitcoin stands firmly in that. It's uh, it's an interesting thing. Where, where did it come from, right? Like ooh, uh, but yeah. I mean, it's a uh, it's a you know like I, I remember at some point I was. Um, talking to my mother about this, right? We would have coffee and we would just talk and she would have all of these questions. She's like, so where is it? Right? I'm like, <laughs> I love it. It was just kind of there, you know, like it's, it's a network of, so that network of them talking to each other. So she'll kind of look up and she'll be like, okay. And so she, she, she's now, you know, can, can almost visualize it. She understands yeah. it's non-inflationary. There's only 21 million. Um, she helped me translate, you know, uh, inflation into 
gishpat, you know, yawaga gishpat, that's inflation, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's a very easy concept for anyone to understand um, and somebody to say they don't understand it. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it cuts at, at everyone's life, right? I mean, yeah. there's often a lot of um, confusion as to what the ills of the world are, right? And yeah. it's, it's, it's really just expensive. You know, like that, like that's the only problem. <laughs> like you know, people just can't eat. You know, like there's there's yeah. there's and and there's a reason why. You know, productivity grows, right? Growth and all of these indicators grow, but the standard of life and you know, I think uh, at least some economies are living less than than previous generations. So, uh, you know, we need to get better in terms of almost everything. You know, yeah. So. Um, and as the Bitcoin thesis goes, you fix, you know, the money, you fix the world, you know? And yeah, so exactly. If you can prescribe uh, appropriate value that's not debased, where Western Union doesn't take a cut, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I'm throwing brand names around, but, you know, it, it, that's because, you know, I have to really go deal with these institutions, you know? And yeah. It, it's, uh, it's not the best customer, you know, I'm not satisfied, you know, paying uh, 14%, paying 7%, you know, to move my money, you know, um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a thing that any African, any Ethiopian, any Eritrean can understand, um, you know, my mother actually knows more than me on this subject, I was like, oh, did you know about inflation? She's like, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> she, she remembers a time when that paper currency was actually, you know, um, worth the yeah. actual silver or gold, right? Um, that was printed on it. And so she was like, yeah, like that was, you know, the thing. And even until, you know, recent history, the Ethiopian burr was very strong, right? Yeah. And, um, and these past, you know, few decades, I think uh, we've seen ourselves go deeper into debt. Um, yeah, and and as a state, it it unfortunately it steps into your sovereignty, and you're not yep. allowed. You can't make decisions on your own interest. You have to fall yep. in line with whatever your debtors um, say is the line. You know, yeah. On on an individual basis, of course, it gives you like f u money. You know, um, yeah. Then from a state perspective too, like look at the states that have caught up, like El Salvador. You know, very cool. Um, but the first one to do it, or one of the first ones, was uh, Norway. You know, they yeah. established um, hundreds or thousands of Bitcoin in their um, sovereign wealth fund. You know, just a yep. rainy day fund. You know, and so, um, so yeah, I think uh, you know the B Bitcoin thesis in in Africa is going to be um, a, a, an easy thing to share, really, because people like my mother understand it so well. Yeah, the utility is very present. And, you know, like um, I'm I read as much as I possibly can. And I find that those like economists or high ranking government authorities who criticize Bitcoin, firstly, I wonder if they've actually like, you know, if they even have a wallet, like if they've tried using the lightning network, I wonder what their exposure is to it really is. And I also wonder if they realize how, I would say condescending they are to people like your mother, like people who have experience, firsthand sort of frontline experience and know exactly what's going on. Like they don't need a published report. They don't need to hear statistics to understand that what they could buy with one unit, you know, 30 years ago, they can no longer buy. Like it now costs seven times that much, for example. I find that we have a tendency to be a little arrogant. Yeah, and overcomplicate things. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I, after some digging, I learned that the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia does have a very good understanding of Bitcoin. They had an entire report about three or four years ago. Um, they just yeah. acted on it, right? So they, 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 okay. they just haven't done anything about it. Um, and so I am kind of begging and challenging, and you've seen me on the Telegram groups, and I, yeah. it leads us into you know 
Bitcoin Burr and Bitcoin Nakba. But essentially, they're, they are me doing as much as I can to like, um, I guess, draw attention to it, you know, because yeah. I, I've been doing it with, you know, 20, 30, right? Um, just within my, my little commerce activities, right? I, I work in media and marketing and I have to pay people. So, you know, uh, yeah. so what I've done for my, my own work, right? Um, and I've been very fortunate. Like I'm, I'm happy with, with you know, um, my clients and things like this. And I, and if only more Ethiopians knew about this, right? They can yeah. have the same privileges that I, you know, they don't need a Credit Suisse account. They don't need a Bank of America. They purely by having a Lightning wallet or a Bitcoin wallet, they can um, work in one of these, you know, remote digital uh, ecosystems. Um, you know, Paxful, uh, Ray, he's doing some cool things. Yeah, totally. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot that, and of course, you know, I would love to, you know, if I have enough projects, hire as many people as I could in, in Bitcoin, you know, I yeah Bitcoin like 10 cents at a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. And, uh, you got a very lovely donation from, uh, the football player. Yeah, that's right. So he's a, he's a. NFL player who, uh, I think last year he said, you know, I'm going to take 13 million of my salary, you know, and and uh, half of it I'm going to put into Bitcoin. So he actually gets paid um, his like payroll. How the however, the, and it took some time for the NFL to do this, um, but yeah. they're now paying half of his uh, salary um, in in Bitcoin. And I think uh, that's amazing. Strike and some other companies are, are involved in kind of the, the back end of how that happens. But, um, but yeah, so he gave a, a you know, a, a donate and, and I don't, I, I don't take donations from people just because I'm not a charity. Like I, I'm yeah, this for, for fun, like I'm drawing attention to it. I, I'm pleading for the Ethiopian government to pay attention. Right. Yeah. And to tax me. <laughs> I'm like, guys, I'm making Bitcoin all day, every day. You got to tax me. <laughs> yeah. I dare you tax me. <laughs> You're probably the only person who's asking for a tax. <laughs> In a digital wallet, because also like, uh, you know, I've been challenging them to say um, uh, that I'll make donations to the Ethiopian government if, uh, if they'll accept it in Bitcoin, right? Um, and so they haven't responded yet. So it's literally just money sitting that they could take advantage of, right? Um, I'm, they can even sell the Bitcoin if they don't want it, right? Uh, yeah. And so, you know, this is this is my way of, of, of uh, talking directly to the government. <laughs> but they don't seem, uh, how do I say, they don't seem to have said, like, no outright to Bitcoin. In the report that you sent to me, uh, they talked about, what was the term they used? Um, use cases or... They referred to like BitPesa and they referred in their digital transformation strategy, they referred to using existing systems or leveraging those existing systems, which does include Bitcoin. So it kind of seems like they're they're kind of warming up to it. Absolutely. No, they're, they'll, they're warm to it. They'll, um, I think they'll adopt um, within their own, uh, on their own grounds and, yeah. and with the Ethiopian interest at in mind. Um, I'm sure they'll have some sort of telecom play, like Ethio Telecom, you know, is, is the, uh, you know, so far the monopoly provider, you know, they've invited in some competition and some new investors. Uh, so, you know, one of those investors are going to get involved for sure. And then they'll find a way to work with the Bitcoin and the local currency, right? Yeah. How do they... A transact among the two is one a settlement layer is one a, um, a transaction layer uh, yeah you know are they pegged in any way or you know so all of those discussions you know reams of people at the national bank are going to have to have consultants they want to open up the, the markets all the banks are going to want to talk about this it's, it's a, a big uh, a big achievement when it's done but it has to get done. And in the meantime, I'm very impatient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is, it's a good attribute to have. I like I'm patient, but I'm, you know, I'm not patient. So 
that's the- take take advantage of that before you have kids because then your time is no longer your own you can't be like 24 7 all the time you have to say okay let me schedule anyways i digress because i'm still a new mom <laughs> but enjoy the fact that you're so driven and you have the time resources to be how, how, how old is your uh, daughter she'll be two in october so she was born. Uh, she was born in October, and we went into lockdown in I want to say March. So that's five months. Five months, and then lockdown, which is nice because we're both at home working, and so like we pick her up from uh, daycare. We spend a lot of time with her on the weekends. Like we dedicate most of our attention to her. She has a very strong sense of self. She's very confident. And my fear is that she thinks that this is normal. And why wouldn't she, right? Because she, like, this is her reality right now, so. Yeah. No, I, I think um, for me, it's, it's, I've had a lot of, uh, let's say, free time. So, um, and, and also, you know, so now it's, it's become the case where, you know, maybe a, if we talked a year ago, right, or two years ago, um, you know, uh, Bitcoin wasn't on really on my radar, and now it's 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 become my life. So um, it's uh, it's turned into a, a, a lot, and I, I you know at some point I'm gonna have to like because you've seen the way I, I, I manage some of those rooms and, and discussions, and maybe I, I should ask you you know what what do you think of, of it? You know, I'm I'm really curious as to. You know what people think of, of kind of the brand and Bitcoin Blur and Bitcoin Nakfa and maybe kind of like your perspective from you know either um, uh, Trinidad um, uh, and and Tobago, uh, um, you know maybe your Swiss background. So what I don't know how how uh, yeah tell me about your um, kind of view of of Bitcoin Blur. My view is, um, so firstly, I think that I'm learning more than I'm actually contributing to it because I see um, everyone giving their addresses and stuff and I see the onboarding process and I think I see part of your strategy, which is to try to expose as many people as possible to Bitcoin. Um, And then in all honesty, I don't have time to read the thousands of telegram messages that come through on a regular basis. So I find myself like going to the group maybe once a week or twice a week, uh, looking at Twitter. I think your Twitter game is very strong. (laughs) Well, (laughs) this coming from a person who's got like 50 followers because I just can't dedicate a lot of time there. But you're always um, tagging people. You're always posting things that I feel are relevant and things that will draw more and more people in. So I think that you're doing very well. And I'm actually very like impressed by the level of energy and attention that you're giving to this. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, that was the uh, uh, that was the mission. That was the objective to just put a lot of heart into it. Um, and, yeah. And you know, I think you, you've, you've noted that um, a lot of uh, you know OGs have, have taken notice and supported. Oh yeah. You know, and you know, said how can we donate and you know what do we need, you know need to do and yeah. Um, moving forward, it's going to be. Um, I, I think it's not going to take money. It's going to take um, uh, just time for it to naturally per- yep. into a conversation. That group has yep. grown to almost 400 people. And the only real objective of Bitcoin Burr and Bitcoin Nakfa at this time is for, for people to learn how to operate a Lightning wallet and yep. get 10 cents in their wallet. You know, if like... If you can get that's amazing ten percent of the population to do that, then uh, at first it's going to be kind of like forcing it, right? Because they're going, "What is this? like Bitcoin?" But it, yeah, <laughs> I don't see it like your mom. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and and actually that that's also kind of a um, strategic play. Um, so in, during my mother's uh, uh, youth. Um, yeah, the sugar was was still kind of a novel item. Uh, it was yeah. it was new in Ethiopia, right? So they didn't know it. They they you know, um, and so I don't want to date my mother, but maybe a little older than my mother. And uh, and so what what the emperor did was uh, after he set up uh, sugar factories, right, to produce sugar because there were sugar canes, so might as well manufacture it and, and 
sell it at a profit, right? Um, he realized nobody was, you know, nobody knew what sugar was, right? And so he, he, he uh, asked the corporation to, and I'm not sure who's doing marketing for them, but they're a genius. <laughs> they would put, you know, 10 cents worth of sugar in a kind of a little, uh, um, a little plastic bag, like a Ziploc, right? Yeah. And they would give it out for free, right? And so it's just as many people as, as and so people are like, ah, oh, what is it? They'll put it in their coffee, they'll put it in their tea, it's, you know, tasty. And today, we actually have to import sugar because the sugar factories don't produce enough sugar, right? The demand is that high. Demand is that high, you know, so. But honey in Ethiopia is amazing. What, what was that? Honey in Ethiopia is amazing. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, I mean, there are tons of natural. I'm not saying the product is right, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying their marketing is on point. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Point taken, point taken. I would, uh, I would prefer that a lot of those you know, sugars uh, leave Ethiopia. Um, and, you know. <laughs> point taken. Their marketing is, is, is uh, so yeah, 10 cents for any person in that group. If they can manage that 10 cent, and, and send it somewhere or, or do this and that, yep. then that's enough. They're, they know more about Bitcoin and they know the difference between Bitcoin and Satoshi, right? A lot yep. of people I talk to still don't know that difference. So it's kind of hard to, you know, explain. It's a process. Actually, you know, you asked me about like, <clears throat> from a Swiss uh, or, or Trinidad and Tobago perspective. Um, and it just occurred to me, um, are you familiar with Jamaican culture? I uh, jerk chicken and uh, you know uh, beautiful food and beautiful kind of you know musical uh, music dance hall yeah absolutely and um, yeah so that's the Rastafari Ethiopians have Ethiopians have a huge kind of uh, community of Rastafarians living in uh, Shashamane right yeah Shashamane absolutely yeah um and just like this is probably i'm just it just came to mind so it's nothing sort of thought out or strategic or anything but uh from that perspective i think there is um like a percentage of jamaican rastafaris who who actually like make it somewhat of a priority in life to visit ethiopia the land of haile selassie as they say and so from a tourist perspective perspective or from a bitcoin perspective maybe there's something there i have no idea because um i'm not too familiar with uh with uh the monetary system in jamaica but it's just something you know to keep in mind if like something comes up absolutely no there's there's a huge connection between between those shared histories, um, as well as the histories of, you know, uh, there, there's, I would say, a, a lot of Rastafarians in the Bitcoin community. And... Ho, 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 wait, 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 wait. There are Rastafarians in the Bitcoin community? That is right. <laughs> I need to tell my sister, sorry, my sister is like in love with Jamaican culture. Like you would hear her speak and you would swear that she's like born and raised. Uh, 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 thank you for that. It'll do that to you. I mean, they have, so, okay, my first experience with kind of Rastafarian cultures. So I grew up in San Jose, uh, California. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the closest University of California was Santa Cruz, right? And so in, and their campus is all along the, the mountain trail, right? So it goes up yeah. and there's like nine or 10 schools. And, um, and so all within the mountains are these kind of communities. And so yeah. in the mountains, you actually have Rastafarians just camping out and living. Out. Yeah. Yeah. And the vegetarian. Yep. There and, and see in their behavior, they're very clean with their food, with, um, you know, kind of very holy and, and how they, they yeah. themselves and, and they address themselves and, um, and very you know, clean eating, clean living, and and this thesis of, uh, well, you know, there's clean money, you know, uh, untapped okay. government, uh, no wars involved, you know, there's some Satoshi guy, we don't know who he is, he started it and left, you know, and probably some pothead, right? And so just kind of built all of these things to where, you know, those two things will, will really... Uh, communicate with each other. And so you know, mm -hmm. my good mentor, uh, Oflo, he's actually a, a rapper. 
you know? Um, yeah. And, and uh, Bobo Dread, you know, he's inviting me down all the time. And he's saying, look, you know, this, this is, you know, the most uh, sovereign thing, you know? Uh, keep oh, wow. Up, right? And, and all of those things type. So, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a, a money nerd. I, 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 uh, I collect uh, currency. Uh, my brother yeah. has currency, and then I'll, I'll take it from my brother. But um, <laughs> and so we have all these old currencies that <clears throat> from the day you couldn't find, right? They weren't really available to people. Um, and so you have the history of, of uh, kind of the, um, the uh, Maria Teresa dollar in Ethiopia, which is gold and yep. silver bullion. And then you have the British pound come, and they try to manipulate the Ethiopian uh, kind of currencies and, and cash um, notes. Um, and then there's the history of, uh, you, you know, you have the Italians um, come and yeah, yeah, yeah. a few years try to insert yep. their, their dominance. Um, and, and then, of course, you have the, you know, the collapse of, of the gold standard in the U.S. in 71, which brought everything crashing down. So... And and Haile Selassie was very smart in, in his approach because he would accept the proposals from the British, he would read them, and they would try to, this is imper his imperial majesty, right? So this is the- Yes, yes, yes. The infamous. I visited uh, the university in his former residence. That's right, that's right. Yeah. His former residence and he donated to the university. And he was actually the minister of education for uh, several years because he, he thought it was such an important position he can't just entrust it to anyone. I have to do it myself, you know? Yeah. But his tie to to money, to actual gold and silver, is really strong. And as the British were coming in with these proposals, uh, you know, it's well documented. Uh, Bafak Adu Dagafe, he's a um, scholar, historian, economist. He, he writes about money. And he writes, you know, clearly about, you know, about these histories. Um, and, and how he would respond and the, the different tricks that the salesman, the, the, you know, the money salesman would, would, they would say, oh, let's call it the high lay dollar, you know, like, yeah. and, and we're, we're going to build you a brand new currency. And, um, at some point they were trying to have it be divisible by the East African shilling, right. Um, which would have had like a one East African shilling be like, I think it was 2000, uh, Ethiopian bur, right? So debasing it from the start, right? Yeah. Uh, because they had already built such a stronghold in Kenya. And so you see these, these nefarious actors <laughs> come from all, all walks, right? Um, and, uh, and Haile Selassie, you know, I mean, as, as much as, as that history went south and, you know, we had, um, communism and then, you know, nothing better kind of follow for decades uh um it, it it's yeah it's one thing that the rastafarian community and the ethiopian community share um yeah their their value for intrinsic value and either it's going to be in your sovereignty your health yeah. or your your natural money you know but I'd like to know, um, in your process of onboarding people uh, through Bitcoin Burr and Bitcoin Nakfa, um, do you notice that, I have to ask this question, um, does like gender, religious belief, like any of these uh, dimensions of diversity get in the way of people understanding Bitcoin or people's ability to use Bitcoin or Satoshis? Uh, I don't think so, um, because uh, it cuts across all of these, you know, um, different boxes, you know? Yep. Uh, I, so I, I guess from my own experience, like I can see from the Bitcoin bur, uh, kind of traffic and audience yeah. that uh, somewhere, but, uh, so in the beginning, about 29% of our audience was were women and then that that and then that um that grew to 39 percent but only because yeah. we targeted women and and tried to like you know so you, when you do the advertising you can say like you know male female and then geography and all of that 
So we would yeah. click on the box that said like female, 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 you know? And so right now we're at 39% women, right? Um, we, and, and, you know, other, you know, if anything, women are going to be even more of a uh, support for Bitcoin, right? Because they're real, you know, they, they're, they take care of households, right? They're yep. entrepreneurs, they, they have many uh, different assignments and, and, you know, they, they accomplish them well. And, and you know, a, a lot of consumer goods are, and decisions are done by the, the woman. So yeah. um, I think in, in some things like that, you know, Bitcoin will have an advantage. Uh, there might be some groups that are, you know, like any new technology or any new uh, solution, there's going to be laggards. Um, yeah, yeah. Pioneers and, and, you know, all of advocates and it'll just kind of naturally develop. Um, but, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that uh, it's been a, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how, how it all develops. We'll see. And in Ethiopia, like uh, in like in some other regions, do you see a lot of women who are entrepreneurs? Women who make things, uh, weave things? Uh, yes, yes. So, I mean, I mean, the economy as a whole, uh, you know, if you look at, um, you know, their uh, size of it, you know, most of it is agriculture. Most of it is kind of in the rural areas. Um, and then you have kind of a push by the government to incentivize manufacturing, right? Yeah. And, and this, of course, includes um, uh, kind of uh, you know easy to assemble items. It, it might include uh, the, you know um, different cottonware and, and cat canvases, and uh, some of the textile giants are, are now working in Ethiopia. Oh yeah, um, yeah. So H and M, you know, through partners and, and this and that, and a PVH Corporation. Um, so you know, those things will will continue to grow. Um, but yeah. but you know, most of the population still doesn't have access to those type of jobs. Um, still doesn't have access to a smartphone or or kind of basic kind of banking um, uh, facilities. So you know the. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be an interest. So, you know, the Bitcoin discussion always comes secondary to the telecom discussion in Ethiopia. Yeah, yep. That's why I was so interested uh, you know, late last night when I got the, uh, the Deloitte report. Um, and they're, you know, talking about uh, privatization of telecom and how it's going to play out and why the industry is, is fruitful and, and all of this. And, um, and some of those numbers, you know, you know, there's a lot expected. You know, there needs to be a lot of capital. There needs to be some good partners um, go in because as of now, you know, we can't fully adopt all of Ethiopia into Bitcoin because not everybody has a smartphone in their pocket. You know? Yeah. And as you say, it's not even about Bitcoin. It's really about uh, the infrastructure. Yeah. that has, that, And I guess you could work through, uh, they call it mesh networks and SMS technology. Like that does exist. You can develop on yeah. it. And, and also, you know, one doesn't have to come before the other, really, because yeah. there are three, four hundred people in that group now. They're all learning. They're like the early pioneers, right? They're like, hey, what's yep. this about? Like, give me 10 cents, you know? And, and so they're going to have it. They're going to think it's silly or whatever. They'll learn about it. Like, you know, as this thing becomes more uh, talked about, they'll kind of go back to it, right? And I guess also, and, and you know, this would probably take me into a, probably a different strategy or, or maybe, you know, I, I would need more help and, and you know, I, I, I bring on more, more people and advisors. But, you know, if this thing is about learning, um, is Telegram really the, the right like channel for that, you know? Yeah, good point. So, you know, uh, Instagram is working okay, but, you know, maybe there needs to be some sort of full-fledged website, right? Or some yeah. sort of application or some uh, some PDF guide, right? And I mean, the, the uh, mission in all of this is to keep it like free. Um, yeah. Open source because it is Bitcoin. Yeah. Because, you know, <clears throat> I would hate to charge somebody a few, you know, nickels to like teach them about money. You know what I mean? Like that seems unfair. Like, mm. like it's gold. You know what I mean? It's not going to go anywhere. Like, yeah. you know, you should get a little sum of it. You should learn about it. And then go about your day, you know. Yeah. Uh, 
if 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 this thing could be free, open source, you know, people can contribute. That's you know that's the idea behind. Yeah. Well, um, like previously, I did an episode with Ashley Chen. She created a website called Bitcoin Wisdom for Busy People. It is like, um, basically, it's curated with so many Bitcoin resources. It's available in English and traditional Chinese. So if there are English speakers in the group, uh, I would direct them to that website because it has a wealth of information central centralized, ironically, <laughs> a wealth of information available in one place. Perfect, perfect. Well, well, and you know, it's it's so interesting to see because, uh, and we'll pull those resources, and I'll put it on the Telegram, I'll put it on um, the website, and you know, anything else that follows. And um, you know, it, it's uh, and, and so you said her name is uh, Miss Chan. You said. Ashley Chen. And the web- the website is bitcoinwisdomforbusypeople.com. I'll send you the link. Perfect, perfect. No, and, I, and I've heard, uh, you know, most most of her, her podcast with, with you. And um, yeah, it's just really surprising to see a lot of my, I guess uh, you can say like uh, advisors or mentors are actually women, you know. So uh, I... Really? Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, it, it's the case with you. It's the case with... Um, you know, people in Ethiopia just, uh, you know, they'll, they'll usually send a, a question and it kind of evolves into, okay, read this and do this, you know. And then it also tends to be the very, uh, like when you look at, um, you talked about Bit Pesa, right? Yeah. The, the, the founder is, is a woman, you know, Elizabeth. No way. Ah. Uh, I'm forgetting her last name, but Elizabeth. Not to be confused with Elizabeth Stark, who um, also is, is the co-founder of uh, Lightning Labs, right? Yep. So they're the ones building the, the kind of the network and, and the second layer, and it makes you know what I'm sending instant and you know pretty much no fees, right? Yep. And so uh, you know, and even within the Ethiopian side, so it it's always you know, um, so maybe in numbers you would think men beat out right and, and and i did talk about that those numbers earlier you know 29 yeah. 39 but the women that are involved are really involved they're actually leading you know um yeah so that digital strategy report the national one from ethiopia that you were reading um yeah. most of it was developed by um i don't want to say her name because i don't know if, how how you know close she wants to be to the project but she's a very well respected woman within you know, kind of the digital um, uh, industry in Ethiopia. And, yeah. and so a lot of the kind of the, you know, going back to your question, you know, where is the Ethiopian government in this? Um, yeah. I am confident that at least some of the decision makers will be women um, because uh, Dr. Abi or prime minister, um, half of his cabinet is made up of women, right? Yep. So, and of course, Bitcoin touches every sector. So, um, you know, and, and, and our president, you know, I had a chance to meet the, uh, the president of Ethiopia. Um, uh, oh, wow. Zodi, and she is, you know, beautiful lady. And, you know, she has a, a wealth of kind of diplomatic experiences. And um, uh, she comes from a Francophone background. Um, and, and, you know, it's going to be these women that make those decisions of, where does Bitcoin come into to play? Can it provide any type of value? You know, how do we sync it with our existing organizations? Um, and and so yeah, I mean, you know, it's actually been a very pleasant. You know, normally you're you work in industries or you're in offices and and in decision making groups, and you can see that some of those actors are. Um, not representative, right, of, of kind of the, the larger picture, right? Yeah, yep, yep. I've seen this in a lot of my work background, right? I've worked with a lot of these government offices and, you know, large, large organizations, right? And, uh, and it's, you know, you kind of leave the room feeling, all right, you know, there was another missed opportunity. There was some segment that wasn't addressed, you know? But thankfully, within this, you know, little Bitcoin community, a lot of the counterparts, um, at least on the Ethiopia side, I think will will kind of slowly envelop this and 
and women have, have really been leading the day on this. For me, um, in my like learning journey about Bitcoin, one thing, so besides the fact that I'm as, absolutely fascinated that Bitcoin has no leader, yet so many different types of people are drawn to it, I'm also, um, I almost feel like this sense of relief because everything is open source. I like, I love to read um, and I can access so many articles, so many pieces of, of information. Like uh, I think it was two years ago, I did, I audited a class on edx.com or something like that with, uh, through the University of California, Berkeley. And it was like a basic Bitcoin course describing what this thing is, how it works. And so I don't know how familiar you, you are with diversity and inclusion and what barriers to inclusion are and how, they're, <clears throat> how they look for the average person going about their business. Um, one barrier is um, access to information. So basically, not everyone has access to the same information, which means that not everyone has the ability to make sound or holistic decisions because they're only given bits and bytes of info. And with Bitcoin through so many people like donating their time driven by passion and driven by by hope, I would say there's information available to anyone who has time, the mental, I guess, capacity, the patience, access to the internet. Of course, that is something that still needs to be worked on. But for the most part, so long as you can access the internet and you're humble enough to acknowledge that you need to learn, you can learn. And so for me as a woman, you know, I've like, uh, you know, I have my undergrad degree, I went to business school, I did another certificate program at Cornell, like, I've been in school for a very long time, I've worked in various uh, uh, environments, I've traveled a lot. This is the first thing for me where I feel that I can learn as much as I want. And I'm only restrained by my time and my daughter, but that's like, <laughs> but that's different. And so I think I don't, I can't speak for other women, but I think that for people who historically have been somewhat discouraged from pursuing things or who have, I don't know, for whatever reason, been denied access to things, discovering Bitcoin is like discovering freedom. Mm, absolutely. I, uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's the thesis. And there still need to be some um, things that happen like on the ground, right? Because yeah. as my mother noted, it's in, it's in the sky, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, that's all and good. But on the ground where you actually have to work with people, you have to go yeah. to the bank manager, right? Yeah, to, 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 to get that local currency or, you know, yeah, you have to barter at those markets and, who's allowed in those markets and yeah you know the the bitcoin story is i think a good one but also it's going to be one where we really have to kind of work on other things too yeah um to see it come to fruition you know and yeah. Yeah. maybe one good thing to to mention is you know a few weeks ago everyone was talking about uh, energy right oh you know clean energy, oh, yeah dirty energy what is energy, carbon credits, right? And, um, and you know, to be honest, those are good discussions, right? How do we have, you know, a renewable, clean, um, non-hazardous, safe energy, right? Affordable energy. Can we use geothermal energy or volcanic, you know? Uh, yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, I think... Bitcoin will help a lot of industries innovate because it's going to be really lucrative to solve these questions. Um, yeah. If you can solve the energy problem, then you can, you know, uh, you mine more Bitcoin, you know? And, yeah. uh, and then also if we have so many of these linkages destroyed, and, and when I say linkages, I don't say them in any good... Uh, when I say linkages, I mean brokers and agents, you know, the, the, the middlemen, right? The middle people, yeah. <laughs> they, they're usually like six or seven middle, really, like when you count. Mm -hmm. like So count the people it, it, or the organizations 
Um, so if you were to send me, you know, fifty dollars from from Switzerland to to I'm now in Texas, you know, how many different organizations does that touch? And do or you know, people need to approve, right? And and you yeah. know, especially international, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had my experiences between, I mean, even between Canada and Switzerland. I'm like, really, a week? Like, <laughs> why does it have to take this long? Yeah. And and so. Uh, and then when you are um, a minority, right? And you know, so, so sometimes it's hard for me to, to speak about like one identity because I, like, I'm, I'm, you know, very Ethiopian, but also my neighbors in Eritrea are equally of me, you know, my African, you know, everyone. And then you go to the islands, you know, and come everywhere, right? So it, yeah. it uh, um, but even within my, you know, you know, it, it's that freedom and that ability to um, place your bet, <laughs> you know, whenever you'd like, and no one can touch that. It's, yeah. It, uh, yeah. And so when, when it gets to minority communities, when it gets to women, whether they're, you know, I, I can't speak to that, right? But I assume that they're going to be more empowered. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. I had a lot of fun speaking with Cal, and I actually, I still chuckle when I think of his airport story. Um, And, you know, I can just imagine his mother looking up and asking, where is it? Where is Bitcoin? (laughs) But Cal's firsthand experience is just showing how Bitcoin is helping to foster financial inclusion in Ethiopia and Eritrea. If you'd like to learn more, visit BitcoinBurr.org or BitcoinBurr on GitHub. And Burr is spelled B-I-R-R. For socials, you can find Cal at CalCasa, and that's spelled K-A-L-K-A-S-S-A, and at BitcoinBurr, and again, Burr is spelled B-I-R-R, and at Bitcoin Nakfa, and Nakfa is spelled N-A-K-F-A. You may also sign a change.org petition called Bitcoin Tender for Ethiopia. And I finally created a Foster Inclusion Twitter account. Find me at F Inclusion. <laughs> That sounds pretty funny. F inclusion. Okay. Haha. But it's F-I-N-C-L-U-S-I-O-N. Ah, we'll call it Finclusion. You can find me at Finclusion. All links, socials, websites, and other materials referenced in our conversation will be included in the show notes. Bye.